Hi everybody, welcome to Dr. Manny's YouTube Learn Shops. In this presentation, we're going to be reviewing and discussing what ESPAR is. ESPAR is an acronym that stands for Situation, Background, Assessment and Recommendation. What we will be reviewing is ESPAR itself and then putting it into the perspective of the diseases and disorders process which includes the subheadings that are displayed. What then is ESPAR? ESPAR is an acronym that stands for Situation, Background, Assessment and Recommendations, and it's a standard way to communicate all information, which includes medical, nursing, healthcare information to improve accuracy and it prevents or decreases the potentially dangerous errors. Well, why use SBAR? SBAR improves accuracy. It was endorsed by the Joint Commission International in 2013 as best practice for communication in healthcare for physicians and nurses. It was endorsed as an easy to use tool. Again, to emphasize to improve communication. The information is presented in a standardized manner and in doing so, then there's less room or less risk of human error. And therefore, it improves accuracy. Why use SBAR? As I said, it's a way to communicate urgent and non-urgent information about your patient. It can include conversations with the healthcare team, during endorsement or shift change, when resolving patient issue, daily safety briefings, escalating a concern, activating the emergency response and the team, in-person discussions and phone calls. Where did it come from? Where did it originate? Well, SBAR was initially developed by the US military specifically to improve communication in nuclear submarines. This spread to the aviation industry and eventually to healthcare. And in doing so, this allows smooth, standardized communication that's given the facts from one person to another person. And in doing so, minimal mistakes. SBAR became the communication tool which was standard for nurses when the Joint Commission endorsed it in 2013. Now, what are some of the words that are typically used in SBAR communication? Remembering the goal with SBAR is to get someone to take action, which means the recommendation must be taken seriously. Using critical language like now, immediately, when a situation is urgent, increases the importance of the recommendation or suggestion. Other critical words that's used in SBAR communication is must, now, necessary, need, critical, immediately, important, priority, quickly, essential, crucial, urgent, imperative, vital, instantly, acute, requires, at once. How should you use SBAR? Well, again, situation basically means create a simple, brief statement of the problem and circumstances. The word brief here is the key. The big part of SBAR is removing irrelevant information. Waffling, padding. Make sure to identify, first of all, yourself, the ward, the area, the setting, the unit. State the patient's name and medical record number. Then we've got background. Background provides you with a concise overview of the situation. And this may include anything that's relevant, the admission date, the time, the diagnosis, medical history, social history, economic history, past history, surgical history, medication history, laboratory results, allergy status, known allergy status, code status, DNR, do not resuscitate, medication information and the names of the physicians or surgeons or healthcare team involved. 
What about assessment? Assessment sums up what you think is going on. It's a professional summary or diagnosis based on the patient's situation and background. Consider results, even physical assessment findings, lab tests, radiology, all investigations. And if you can't create a clear, a clear assessment, just state that. I really don't know what's going on here, so I really can't provide you with an assessment of the situation and background. When it comes to recommendations, clearly state what you're requesting. Be specific about the suggested action and time frame. And in verbal communication, repeat back any order for the greatest accuracy. Making a simple or making just a recommendation is and can be simple just as saying, I'd like you to check on this patient, doctor, nurse, physiotherapist, pharmacist, and so on. Who should use SBAR? Well, according to the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality in 2015, SBAR should be used by nurses communicating with doctors, nursing assistants communicating with nurses, physicians communicating with physicians, Residents communicating with attending physicians. Nurses communicating with nurses. Nurses communicating to technicians. Pharmacists communicating with nurses and or physicians. Administrators communicating with physicians. SPAR is a very important tool that can be used by all healthcare providers. Here's an example of SPAR. Situation. I'm nurse Karen Smith from Medical Ward X calling about Miss F. The temperature was elevated throughout the night. She's now shivering and has rigors. The background is Miss F has a history of a severe bladder infection and has an indwelling urinary catheter. Her temperature is now 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Her urine is foul smelling and cloudy. Her catheter was changed two weeks ago. She took Tylenol every four hours through the night. She is increasingly more confused at this present point in time. What's your assessment? Miss F seems to have a urinary tract infection. Your recommendation, I'd like to get a urine sample order for culture and sensitivity. And based on the results, I'd like to suggest that you order an antibiotic, please, doctor. In the meantime, I suggest encouraging Miss F to drink more fluids, increase her intake. Another example, situation. Good morning, Dr. Z. I'm nurse Bill Jones from the Home Care X calling about Miss P. Her weight, respirations and blood pressure are all elevated. It concerns me. The background is that Miss P is a 75-year-old patient. She's got a diagnosis of hypertension and congestive heart failure. Her blood pressure is increased. In actual fact, it's extremely hypertensive. 190 or 92, and her respirations are 25 breaths per minute. She's short of breath when she ambulates, and her weight has increased by 7 pounds in 5 days. When I auscultate, she's got crackles in the posterior bilateral lower basis, and however, she is compliant with the medications, and she has a low-sodium diet, which she's also compliant with. Other than the one exception was a very salty dinner, she informed me yesterday. On my assessment... She has fluid retention, which was possibly made worse by a previous high salt dinner. My recommendation is to give Miss P a dose of intravenous ferrosamide Lasix, continue with her daily AM Lasix dose, and I'd like to get her husband to measure her urine for one day to assess her diuresis, her urine output. Also, I'd like to make further recommendations as I'm concerned about her shortness of breath and her respiratory status. Please advise. Another example. Good morning, Dr. C. This is Sharon in the CT lab. I've got an order for patient L who requires a pulmonary embolism study today. I'd like to clarify the order because he has an elevated creatinine. Patient L came in with a shortness of breath, difficulty of breathing, and right-sided chest pain, which was the background, which emphasised the fact that maybe the patient has a pulmonary embolism. 
On assessment, patient L's creatinine level was 3.1 millimoles per litre, which is far above our endpoint level for these studies. My recommendation is I think we should change the PE study order to a VQ SAM order. Please advise. Example 4. Harriet is a 53-year-old woman whom the emergency medical technicians brought in after a motor vehicle accident. She's got minor scratches and bruises. The nursing staff monitoring her for signs of concussion. Three hours of observation. The nurse believes she's ready to be discharged. This is the situation. Harriet X was admitted to the hospital this morning at 9am and besides the concern of concussion, she really doesn't have any serious injuries. The background is she's alert, orientated since her admission this morning and she's returning home to care to her husband. My assessment is I think that she has not really suffered a serious concussion and she's stable and she could be discharged. My recommendation is I suggest we continue monitoring her for another 30 minutes and then proceed or prescribe an over-the-counter medication analgesia before we discharge her because she does have a headache. Example 5. A patient, Mr T, is a 33-year-old male and he's got severe pain. The nurse needs to communicate with an on-call physician. The situation is this. Dr Z, my name is Jane X. I'm calling from Hospital XXX regarding your patient. Mr T is experiencing severe shortness of breath and complaining of chest pain. The background is Mr T received shoulder, sur shoulder surgery Yesterday, you were the surgeon. He began complaining of chest pain about one hour ago. On pulse oximetry, we can't detect a consistent pulse. That's giving erratic readings. And his blood pressure is 111 on 54, and his breathing is quite laboured. Marked use of accessory muscles. Sir, I believe the patient is experiencing a myocardial infarction or a pulmonary embolism. My recommendation is I request you come immediately and assess the patient and I plan to put him on 15 litres of um, face mask, non-rebreather mask, oxygen. Do you agree? Please advise. Example 6. The nurse is communicating with a patient the patient details to the physician. The situation is the EMTs brought Mr P, a 73-year-old man, into the emergency department at 7 a.m., with probable pneumonia. He was stable but very short of breath. The background is he doesn't really have any significant past medical history. He's a non-smoker, only a casual drinker and he takes antihypertensive medications. His vital signs are stable but he was febrile, 37.9 degrees centigrade, a fever. And he does have an elevated white cell count. He recently returned from an overseas flight. I don't believe that he has had a pulmonary embolism my assessment is he's got a productive cough, which is purulent, he has chest pain, and he does have shortness of breath. I think the chest pain is related to pleurisy. I think he has pneumonia. My recommendation is I'd like to repeat or get you to request a repeat CBC, suggest a chest X-ray, and recommend that he has prophylactic antibiotics. Does that sound like a suitable course of action to you, sir? SBAR 6 again. The situation is this. The patient's been hospitalised for an upper respiratory tract infection. The respirations are laboured. Their tachypneic at 28 breaths per minute. Sounds on auscultation, wheezing, SBO2, 78 on pulse oximetry. Her usual interventions have been ineffective. So the background basically is this is a 72-year-old female with a past medical history of congestive heart failure and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the patient's breathing has deteriorated in the last 30 minutes. Both salbutamol, bronchodilator inhalation, and oxygen therapy have been ineffective. What's my recommendation? I think we should call the physician immediately and be prepared to activate the rapid response team in the event that there are additional issues. Consider intubation and transfer to the ICU after the physician has reviewed her or the rapid response team have reviewed her.
Now let's look at what are the effects of SBAR. Studies have shown that in healthcare situations, critical information is often left out. We don't communicate effectively when we interact between professionals. And these omissions increase patient harm and reduce patient safety. SBAR has been shown to enhance patient outcomes, makes nurses more effective, creates higher patient and family satisfaction scores, makes report more relevant and concise, improves communication between healthcare providers, especially nurses and doctors, has had a dramatic effect on the overall patient health and leads to less hospitalizations, shorter hospitalizations and decreased patient morbidity and mortality. However, are there any limitations to SBAR? Well, Always, as there is with every situation, SBAR doesn't help every situation. The tools main problem that have been identified are we don't understand the correct way to use SBAR. Nurses and other users may feel insecure about completing the recommendation part of the tool. SBAR may run into Health Insurance Probability and Accountability Act. These are confidentiality issues. And problems can occur when discussing patient information that goes overhead by others. Confidentiality again. What's the conclusion? Well, the conclusion regarding SBA is that it's easy to use and the method improves accuracy and it works best for nurses and physician interaction, either word verbally or written. And it's standardized and it's endorsed by the Joint Commission International, and this is recommended because it increases patient safety. SBAR is a tool for commuting patient information in a standard, effective approach. In addition to SBAR, I think it's important to review as nurses the diseases and disorders process, which includes all these subheadings which we'll look at. In order to review this, I'm going to use an example being cardiogenic shock, pump failure, to demonstrate the process clearly. First, we need to be able to define the problem. This problem is cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock is a life-threatening condition in which the heart suddenly can't pump blood to meet metabolic requirements. The condition is most often caused by a severe heart attack, but not everyone who has a heart attack goes into cardiogenic shock. So we have an understanding of what the problem could be. Then we look at the etiology, the cause. Cardiogenic shock, the most common cause of cardiogenic shock is a heart attack, myocardial infarction. Other healthcare problems that may lead to cardiogenic shock include conditions such as heart failure, chest injuries, drug side effects, conditions that prevent blood from flowing freely through the heart, such as a pulmonary embolism. Then we look at the pathophysiology. Cardiogenic shock typically occurs because of a myocardial infarction, which is a medical emergency. And it usually occurs because of atherosclerosis, which results from, or results in, actually, um, arteriosclerosis, coronary artery disease. And this is a blockage to the coronary arteries that supply blood to the heart. And this could result in death of heart tissue, myocardial ischemia, infarction. When we use SBAR, the communication to the ICU on call, for example, at two o'clock in the morning. Good morning, Dr. Z. I am Nurse G from ICUX calling about Mr. P. Mr. P is a 45 year old patient who was admitted with an acute myocardial infarction and is now, or was, in cardiogenic shock about two days ago. The background is, his medical history includes unstable angina, hypertension and congestive heart failure. He did have an echocardiogram which showed poor left ventricular contractility with an injection fraction of about 45%. Currently, his blood pressure is 80 on 60. His pulse pressure is only 20. His pulmonary capillary reach pressure is 24, respiration is 35, and he's hypoxic, even though on oxygen, with a saturation of 90%. Look, he has vasopressors going, IV dopamine, 5 mics per kilogram per minute, and he is on 
a face mask of six litres per minute. My assessment is I'm concerned about Mr P because he's deteriorated and he's hypertensive. Cardiac contractility is decreased. He appears worse. And his vital signs identify poor tissue perfusion with cold, pale, clammy skin, a computer refill time of greater than five seconds, and as I said, he's got a narrow pulse pressure of 20 millimeters of mercury. My recommendation is, sir, I'm concerned about his cardiovascular situation, and I would like you to review him as soon as possible. But in the meantime, I would like to increase his dopamine infusion to 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute and increase his oxygen therapy to 15 liters per minute non rebreather mask, please advise. What about diagnostic evaluation? Well, the diagnostic evaluation for cardiogenic shock includes pulse rate, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure measurement, electrocardiogram, chest X-ray, blood tests such as cardiac markers, troponin I, T, C, K, and V, echocardiogram, and in other situations possibly, cardiac catheterization, and a coronary angiogram to identify where the lesions in his coronary circulation are. What about assessment? This is physical assessment, physical examination, and this includes neurologically altered mental state, loss of consciousness, respiratory system, severe shortness of breath, tachycardia, peripheral pulses, they're probably going to be faint and maybe rapid and irregular, cold, pale, clammy skin, rapid breathing, dyspnea, cyanosis, maybe even mottled extremities, and definitely jugular venous extension, as demonstrated in the image in front of you. What about the medical management? Well, here's a flow diagram, and I'm not gonna go through it in any great detail other than say, if cardiogenic shock is suspected, always history and physical examination and what was previously mentioned. In the previous slides. If it's an acute coronary syndrome, there's a certain pathway that should be followed. If it's confirmed that it's cardiogenic shock, then hemodynamic support is important, as we mentioned, vasopressor and inotropes, dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, oxygenation, maybe even intubation and ventilation, maybe even an intraaortic balloon pump, counterpulsation, or other assist devices such as an impeller left ventricular assist device, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or maybe here, synchronized um, uh, um, pump therapy. But again, the ultimate outcome would be to upgrade to a left ventricular assist device or a biventricular assist device if they were unstable. If it wasn't an acute coronary syndrome, then these guidelines will be directed by the medical therapy for congestive heart failure, maybe steroids, um, tissue plasminogen activator, uh, and other interventions. But again, every organisation will have their own protocols for confirmed medical diagnosis. Cardiogenic shock is just one of them. Then let's, let's look at SBAR again at 3 a.m. Situation. Good morning, Nurse Judy. This is Dr. Z. I'm the consultant that you called about Mr. P and I've been thinking about it, and this is the 45-year-old patient who was admitted with an acute myocardial infarction and cardiogenic shock two days ago, correct? The background is, I'm essentially just following up on his cardiovascular status since I saw him at 2 a.m. when you called me. And the response to increase the dopamine infusion to 10 mics per kilogram per minute and oxygen therapy 15 liters per minute with non-rebreather mask. I, I wanna know what's going on. So my assessment of it, I was concerned about Mr. P because he did deteriorate and he was hypotensive and he had decreased myocondrial jelly and he did have a narrow pulse pressure and all the signs of shock decreased tissue perfusion. As you advised, my recommendation to you is if Mr. P is stable with his cardiovascular and respiratory status following the increase in dopamine infusion to 10 mics per kilogram per minute and the oxygen therapy at 15 litres per minute with non rebreather mask, just continue monitoring and advise me if his status is of concern to you. Otherwise, I'll review him at 6 a.m. when I come in and I do a round, a grand round. Is that suitable? Understood? Please advise. What's the nursing management? 
a cardiogenic shock. Now remember, basic life support. A, B, C, D. Reverse the shock. All you can do is follow the prescribed prescriptive orders from the physician, administer the oxygen, make sure there's IV access, maybe fluid volume would be appropriate, and certainly vasoactive infusions and medications. Administer blood products if ordered, and your nursing assessment should include pulse, rhythm, blood pressure, CVP, respiratory rate, saturations, urine output, skin colour, and monitoring the appropriate laboratory results. So what are the complications? What are the complications associated with cardiogenic shock? Cardiopulmonary arrest, life-threatening dysrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, renal failure, multi-organ system failure, ventricular aneurysm, thromboembolic sequelae, stroke and even death. What about the prognosis? And again, we're just talking about the prognosis of cardiogenic shock, but it could be any medically identified situation. Cardiogenic shock, to reinforce, is one of the leading causes of death in relation to acute myocardial infarction. In the absence of aggressive, highly experienced medical, nursing and technical care, mortality rates among patients in cardiogenic shock exceed 70 or up to as high as 90%. The overall in the hospital mortality rate for patients with cardiogenic shock is pretty high, even in hospital, 39%. And it ranges from between 27 and 51%. For persons elderly, more than 75 years of age, the mortality rate is 55%, if not higher. In those younger than 75%, 75 years, sorry, is 29 to 29.8%. For women, compared to men, women higher, 44.4%, and men, 35.5%. What about rehabilitation? Are patients with cardiogenic shock able to be rehabilitated? Well, if the cardiogenic shock was related to ischemic heart disease, patients may be referred to exercise-based rehabilitation programs to manage signs and symptoms and reduce future issues. However, studies do and have shown that exercise cardiac rehabilitation reduces the risk of hospitalization extended and cardiovascular death. So they're important. So rehabilitation is essential. And it's more than just exercise based. It's teaching the patient about what they should do, medication compliance, and so on. So let's review. Can anybody explain the acronym for SBAR. The acronym is Situation, Background, Assessment and Recommendations. It's a standard way to communicate medical, nursing, paramedical, any information and it improves accuracy and decreases the risk of life-threatening events. What about the role of S in the SBAR tool? Well, we said it's situation. The situation is there. It's a brief, simple statement of the problem. However, before you communicate, make sure that whoever you're communicating to, you identify yourself, the ward, the area, the setting, the unit, and state the patient's name and full medical record number. Identify the patient. What about B in the SPAR tool? What does that mean? B is the background, and this provides an overview of the situation and includes relevant information such as admission, diagnosis, all the related histories and lab results, radiology, their allergy status, their code status, medications that they're on, and any physicians that may be involved in their care. What about A in the SPAR tool? A stands for Correct. Assessment. Assessment sums up what you think is going on. And it's a professional academic summary or diagnosis based on the patient's situation and background. And you do, you must consider any additional findings such as lab results, investigations, radiology, any tools that may provide information. So 
Here, if you can't do that, the simplest thing is to not bandy around the bush, just say, I can't provide that, I have, don't have that information. Then finally, the R in the SBI tool. What does that mean? And this is one that most nurses are reluctant to initiate. It's recommendations. And in your recommendations, you aren't being derogatory, you aren't being overbearing, you are just clearly stating what you think should be done. And you state it in relation to action and time frame. So it's verbal communication where you repeat back any information, you make recommendations that are simple, saying, gee, it could be as simple as, I'd like you to check on this patient, please, doctor, as soon as possible, because I have a concern about his condition. Okay, that's the end of this Dr. Manny Learn Shop. Again, if you think it's been of any value to you, please recommend it to your colleagues, and I will see you in other workshops. If you think it's been important, sure, subscribe. But I'm more interested in the fact that you get benefit out of what I provide you here. Okay, see you next time.